so let's just get started. So Holly, hello again. Hello. It's your Thank second you for time. having me. Thank yeah. you. It's your second time on Ministry Monday. Mm -hmm. Happy so to be here. You're back. We didn't scare you off the first time after talking about Advent in light of COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, talking about light in the midst of darkness is something that's always uh, invigorating, I think. So Advent was a beautiful thing to make me want to come back. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And so I asked if we could sit down and talk today because I was hoping that we could talk in light of Women's History Month. This is Women's History Month. And, uh, you know, I've discussed on the podcast before how important the role of women are, the, how important women are in the church. Um, we do so much and we, we serve so much to the best of our ability and our calling. Um, and so I kind of want to highlight that for the next couple of minutes here. Um, and so you and I have had many discussions about women who have, through history, um, who have made a difference through social justice, through their own calling, whatever that is. And so I wanted to ask you, first off, what are some of the names that you think of and the, the, the stories behind those who have been empowered in the church to do their work and who have been powerful as a result? Yeah, I love I love those questions and that sense of women uh, being powerful in the church in some way. Of course, we know that that in many ways that's not always the focus that we experience or that we've seen through history. That women, um, you know, arguably are still disempowered in the church in many ways. Uh, but I think there's something so significant about seeing how women have shaped the church in large part, um, and then also how women are able to derive meaning and purpose from a, a deep connection to God and to community that uh, finds its core and finds its fount in the church. So uh, thinking through these questions, the, the four women that immediately kind of stood out to me that have been formative in, in my faith life, uh, are St. Mary Magdalene and Hildegard of Bingen, uh, Julian of Norwich, and Dorothy Day. So uh, I'm not sure if you have a, a preference in, in beginning with any of those four, but those are kind of my, my top four. I don't. Start with whomever you'd like. Okay, okay. Uh, so our, our oldest, oldest child is Juliana Magdalene. Um, so she kind of got got a twofer in her <laughs> intercession. <laughs> um, she was born on the feast day of St. Mary Magdalene, July 22nd, which, which felt very special. Um, with Mary Magdalene, let's start with her, because of course she, she in some ways kind of started the church, arguably, right? I mean, so she, she saw the resurrected Jesus before anybody else. Um, she was certainly a very close friend of Jesus, if not, you know, his, his best friend, maybe, arguably, um, and something, so that, that in itself already, that deep relationship with Christ, the witness to the resurrection of Christ, those already are so life-giving, right, that witness of, of seeing, that witness of knowing that life triumphs over death, that's what I think of first when I think of Mary Magdalene. Um, but beyond that, we see such a vulnerability in Mary Magdalene too, which is just so helpful. We see her, her humanity in such precise and interesting ways. So for instance, uh, I, my heart always breaks a little bit in that part in the gospel when Jesus says, don't cling to me, Mary. Um, and there's some, there's some piece of that that makes me a little angry at Jesus, like be nice to her <laughs> She's with you in all these really important times. Um, but also just the, uh, oh, the, the incisiveness of, of a line like that from Jesus though, what is he cutting through? He's, he's talking about this sense that we have of not knowing. And so, you know, that sense of wanting to cling, of wanting to kind of own our relationships or the kind of sadness that comes when we, um, when we're not able to have space between self and other. And, and I just think that's so relatable. 
um, both what Jesus says to Mary and Mary's sense of Jesus, of wanting to have him so close that um, that she doesn't have to encounter the, the fear of loss and the sadness of loss, um, because that's so much a part of relationship. So I just love the humanity of Mary. I love the intimacy of Mary and Jesus. I love all of that. Um, Hildegard of Bingen, a very different person. Do we want to jump? already oh yeah let's jump because pastoral musicians also holly i mean we yeah we so re we so relate to hildegard so yes yeah. please please go yeah i know i mean how many people in the church do we have who are composers and theologians and healers um and and prophets and mystics and abbesses all of those things um so that's just awesome to begin with that she is all of those things um, and that she seems to have excelled in so many of them. So, I mean, there's a dimension of that that's impressive, of course, but something that I think I love that's even deeper than just how impressive Hildegard is, um, is that sense of seeing that truth and beauty essentially are one, um, hmm. the, that she's able to find truth and beauty and flourishing in all of those things, I think indicates some kind of interdependence of creation and diversity of how God manifests. So I think that Hildegard just kind of models the, the multiplicity and the unity of God through all of these different ways that she's able to uh, find excellence and beauty in the world. Um, I am also really excited about her theory or her, her concept, her word veriditas, um, which means greening, basically translated as greening. And, and she uses veriditas throughout, throughout so much of her theology. And it has this sense of um, the presence of the Holy Spirit coursing through all of nature. So this is part of why um, her, her stance as a healer or, or as uh, you know, divine physician in some way, those go together, her theology and her natural sciences, um, because she saw nature and the world as just coursing with the spirit of God. Uh, she reminds me in many ways of, of Bonaventure in this way, St. Bonaventure, who had a theory of panentheism, not pantheism where God is nature, but panentheism where God is wholly in nature and also beyond transcendent. So um, Hildegard speaks of that to me, uh, which just seems so hopeful. It reminds me of that sense of the God who makes all things new, mm -hmm. sense of greening. Uh, so, I love to even even again that sense of vulnerability in Hildegard that she had these these visions she was a prophet and yet she didn't want to speak them because she thought she sounded crazy and she thought she would make people angry so she didn't want to speak to them and she mm -hmm. would spend weeks in bed with um with headaches and paralysis until she would speak so she was compelled to speak the truth that God wanted to make known through her um, and yet again, that very, very human sense of vulnerability and frailty that it would literally make her sick until she did her work, which is kind of awful, but very relatable, I think. So um, Hildegard as aspirational and relatable. I think too, if we could just pause there too, I do think there's something to be said there in reflection for a lot of people who are listening who minister, whether that's in faith formation or music or both, um, because I do think there was some type of almost like a phantom limb syndrome this time last year when we weren't preparing for Holy Week, or at least many dioceses were not. Yeah. We were not in person for liturgy. And there was this feeling this, I mean, I'll just speak for myself. Like there was this like hollow feeling. There was a physical loss feeling within me as we started a triduum in particular, because we, you know, it, it feels so normal in ministry to be preparing for this holy, sacred walk of Triduum. And for us to not do it among the people of our community or anyone for that matter, there was, I felt a physical change that week. Oh, that's a great insight. Yes. Yes. When you're not able to do the work you think God is calling you to do, it can literally physically hurt. Mm -hmm. How interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Hildegard is a special, special place for, uh, for us as musicians. Now you mentioned that you named Juliana. 
Julia. After the saints. Yes, yes. And our other daughter, Sage, is Sage Hildegard. So kind of a wise one plus Hildegard. No pressure. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> No pressure for your life, Sage. That could just be a blessing and an inspiration. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I hope she takes it that way. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so who was next on your list? Um, Julian. Julian. Oh, yeah. Yeah, or Juliana of Norwich, as she is sometimes called. And mm -hmm. it's Norwich, right? Because she's British, but, you know, I'm an American, so I use the W, Norwich. Um <laughs> She is just amazing. So she lived a little bit after Hildegard, about 300, 300-ish, 300 400-ish years after Hildegard. Um, Julian is, is the author of Revelations of Divine Love, which is the first known book written in English by a woman. Isn't that awesome? I feel like- I didn't know that. Very often. Yeah. Yeah. So she's super significant on so many levels, but um, Julian, oh- so beautiful and interesting to me in large part because uh, she is very much within the kind of orthodox tradition of the church. And also um, she, she has these kind of mildly subversive threads that are from, from God in her visions, um, but again, are just kind of pushing the envelope a bit. She talks about God as mother, for instance. That's one of her main images of God. Um, and, uh, and also as father. But, but of course, that sense of mother still kind of challenges us, even in 2020, 2021. Where are we in life? 2021. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but, but because she experiences, even in this, this deep, debilitating illness that she ends up getting, um, she experiences the gentleness of God, even as she's experiencing, again, this, this physical agony and also kind of living into the crucifixion of Jesus. She had prayed to be able to experience the passion of Christ in some way. So as she's experiencing these things, she is still at the very same time um, experiencing this, this gentleness and this comfort that speaks to her of a mother God in some way. Um, I also love about Julian with all of these women, actually, again, that, that deep sense of connection of self to God. Um, Julian lived as an anchorite. So she lived completely alone in this cell that was attached to a church and her, the work of her life um, was to basically be in there praying and then wait for visitors. So people would come to visit her at her little window and she would dispense spiritual wisdom and accompaniment to anybody who came to her. Um, and she was famous also for having kind of dispensed that wisdom to Marjorie Kemp, which is another of my famous favorite people that I'm not including in this list, but um, <laughs> we, should, we should read Marjorie Kemp. Um, so, so I love, I love that sense of fullness that Julian finds in God so that she can live completely alone for God, but also for others um, with that with that sense of radical hospitality, keeping her, her life and her window literally open for anyone who needed her, needed prayer, needed accompaniment, um, which might be a good segue into to Dorothy Day, sense of mm -hmm. radical hospitality, okay. right? So um, I love Dorothy Day. I am also scared of Dorothy Day. So um, <laughs> sometimes you hear about Jesuits saying that uh, they fear meeting Ignatius more than God because they fear that Ignatius would um, would maybe judge <laughs> judge them more than God would. <laughs> they were a good enough Jesuit. I kind of feel similarly about Dorothy Day. <laughs> um, she's a formidable presence, right? But uh, Dorothy Day course. So she lived from late 1800s, 1897, um, till 1980. So just missed her. Um, but so many things to love about Dorothy Day. Certainly that sense of radical hospitality. Of course, we know her for her houses of hospitality, um, her Catholic worker movement that she founded with Peter Morin. Um, but some of the things that I really connect to, especially with her, um, I love that there's a relationship through her whole life between writing, activism, and charity and justice. 
So she's, she's always living this life of um, being an artist, being kind of an intellectual, and at the same time being, you know, down and dirty in the throes of, of the realities, the grittiest realities of everyday life and every, every person's life around her, really. So um, I, I feel like so often it seems as though we need to choose between kind of a life of the mind or a life of doing um, and that both of those sides kind of look down on each other, right? Like the, the doers are like, you know, you intellectual people, you're just up in your ivory towers. And then the, the intellectual people are like, you know, you know over there, riff raff or something like that, you know, like there's a sense of, of um, not, not fully understanding the other way of being in the world. So mm -hmm. love that about Dorothy, that she, she merges those worlds very well. And I love also that she follows her path so radically. Um, I mean, in many ways, she points to the lives of the saints for being kind of a template for what she did. But, but I think in some ways, there was no template to live the way Dorothy Day lived. She was, um, she was so, so Catholic, you know, a, a daily mass goer, a daily rosary prayer, um, one of those very, very traditional Catholics. Um, and yet she also was in many ways formed by communism, right? And certainly socialism, even into her later life, she, uh, you know, let go of the communism because of its atheistic ties in many ways. But she certainly maintained that sense of uh, a, a pretty radical social vision um, politically. And yet she saw that as the way that she was called to live out the gospel. So she didn't see this as kind of a warring way of being in the world that was separate from her Catholicism. She saw them as intimately linked together. And yet again, that was so, so rare and radical then, and even you know rare and radical now, but, but certainly, um, at that point in the history of the church. So I just so admire her capacity to listen, listen to God. Um, in the atrium with the children, we talk about uh, the atrium in Catechesis of the Good Shepherd being a space to uh, listen, listen to God, of course. And we talk about the prophets as being people who were able to listen to God with their whole being. And I think that that's really what she was able to do to listen to God with her whole being to create this life that hadn't really existed before. Um, and finally then, I think, I, I remember reading in the recent biography about Dorothy Day by her granddaughter, Kate Hennessy, that Dorothy had not necessarily set out to found a soup kitchen or to do these uh, works of, of charity and justice that she did in the precise ways she did them. Um, but because she was living in the depression and she would see so many people going hungry every day, she just thought this is the work that needed to be done and this is the work that she could do. Um, and so that ended up being her life's work because it needed to happen and she could do it. And so to consider yeah, maybe we're not all called to have a life that looks exactly like Dorothy Day's, but what is the work in front of me that needs to be done and that I can do? Um, it's such a simple question, and yet how, how inspiring to consider, yes, it's in front of me, I can do it, like that's how I can follow Dorothy, right? Like that's, that's accessible and it's necessary. What a courageous thing to do too. I keep thinking about what you just said, like, you know, being a servant of God with your whole being. Yeah. I mean, there's something so courageous to me about that. And so, oh man, so intimidating, I think in a way, you know, but, yes. but so inspiring, but just very daunting, I think to me, but a wonderful challenge and, you know, things to work towards. But I also really like the idea of, you know, if, if someone were new to maybe having a regular prayer life, I think that would be a very simple way to start praying is to like, get out of bed. And as your feet hit the ground for the day, just ask the questions, what can I do in front of me today, you know, to, to serve God and to serve others. 
Yes. I, that's a very simple way I think of discipleship. Totally. Yeah, totally. I agree. So consider the whole work of these ladies' lives, it seems impossible. But if you consider right. how they did it, that does seem possible. So as we wrap up, if you have any recommendations for books on these four women, would you be willing to share that information for me? And I can put it in the show notes of the episode. Yes, I will. Can I, can I send it to you in, in text? Yeah. Be all right. Okay. Yeah. I'll do that when we conclude here then. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. So if you're listening or you're watching, check out the show notes of this episode at ministrymonday.org and you'll be able to find continued reading which is, I think, a great way to continue the conversation. I always love, not to give everyone homework who's listening, but I love a good conversation that continues past the podcast episode. And I think that this one, this one merits that. So yeah, I think it'll be great. So thank you in advance for sending that information. And thank you for just sharing your insights and your wisdom about women in the church who over the course of the church's history have been powerful, but also have kind of exuded a holy power that yeah. they've been able to embrace and that we as women in the church can hopefully try and emulate. Yes. I love the sense of the, the model of power that Christ gives us, right? That, that when we can know our dignity, we can be empowered then to empower others. And I think we have a lot of great examples of women in the church who do that. So I, I love it. And I find it very inspiring. Thank you for having me on. Thank you.